the great honour of um, welcoming everyone and uh, saying uh, welcome to, in particular, to um, Lisa and Bridget and Catherine here who are going to present tonight and Steve who is hosting. Uh, but just in, in case people don't know me, uh, I'm Victoria Palmer, the Director of our Research Translation Centre. And uh, this is funded by a special initiative in mental health by the National um, Health and Re Medical Research Council. And we bring together many different people across the nation and many institutions. And um, it's my honour to acknowledge country and acknowledge uh, the Wurundjeri people where I'm joining from. And I can see that there's an acknowledgement for Steve um, for where you're joining from. And I welcome you to put in your... Um, where you're joining from into the chat uh, today, today as well. So I'll pay my respects to Elders both past and present and extend that respect to Indigenous people here present today. And just noting um, on the, the sides there of our um, <clears throat> slide that that's a beautiful artwork by our First Nation, Nations artist, Dennis Golding. So also in fitting with the um, centre and our objectives, we'd like to recognise lived experience um, and just encourage everyone to speak honourably and respectfully about our ongoing emotional distress and experiences of trauma, mental ill health and the work of caring and all of the experiences of care within this context. So this is our virtual cafe series. Um, I don't even know what number we are up to but we have a terrific talk planned uh, for the evening. And from here, I'm going to hand over to you, Steve, and let you uh, take the reins for the night. Okay. So thank well, you. Yeah, um, welcome as well, everyone. So um, we're going to have a very interesting talk about um, community-based interventions for people with severe mental illness. And this was um, a systematic review and uh, narrative synthesis that was published in World Psychiatry. <laughs> And I was, I was telling um, our presenters how jealous I was in terms of how they got into world psychiatry. And I definitely had impact factor envy. Um, and unfortunately, um, Carol um, isn't able to join us. She's, um, this, this might seem like an oxymoron, but she's in sunny Scotland on holiday. Um, so, but we, we still have uh, three great speakers. Uh, next slide. By way of introduction, um, I'm the uh, I lead the stream B in the Centre on Priority Populations Research, particularly looking at physical and psychiatric comorbidity. And please put questions in the chat or following the talk. And you know, as it says, add in your views and questions along the way. So next slide. So. Um, uh, I'm sure that these many um, these speakers are probably well known for um, to a lot of people. Um, they are um, they do uh, they do great work and 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 are very good speakers. Um, uh, Lisa was um, originally at the University of Melbourne, is now at La Trobe, and um, uh, Catherine um, is also at La Trobe, and Bridget is at the University of Melbourne. And um, uh, I think that's all from me. And um, I look forward to, day, to this evening's talk. Thank you. We'll, we'll leave it in your capable hands, Lisa and Bridget and Catherine, and welcome and thanks for your time. Well, thank you so much for that lovely introduction, um, Vicky and Steve and everyone who's um, been involved in um, helping us to this uh, event together tonight. And it's so lovely to see so many familiar faces. It's, um, it's lovely, even though you're there on the screen, I can still, still see quite a few of you. Um, and we'll be sharing the presentation today. So um, we're, we're going to do a little bit of a tag team effort. Um, but what we really wanna do is explore this, um, take you through this, paper that we, um, that we prepared for World Psychiatry, as Steve said, um, on community-based social interventions for people with severe mental illness. 
Uh, but first of all, we also wish to acknowledge that we're on the lands of the Wurundjeri people and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend this respect to any First Nations participants joining us today. And Kat, would you? Yeah, and I'd also like to acknowledge and welcome all the individuals who are coming in with diverse um, experiences, especially um, individuals who are identifying as lived experience, including the lived experience of being meant, of having mental distress or recovery and of caring and providing support. Yeah. So um, I just, by way of background, I just want to introduce you to a much larger team than even uh, the four of us. Um, uh, and Priscilla, I think, uh, is there in the in the in the uh, amongst the participants. And uh, Priscilla has been a really important member of this team as well. So um, we've really been building our skills um, together. And what that's been about is really recognizing that the needs of people living with severe mental illness has to a certain extent been often neglected by research and innovation efforts. Um, and we feel that that's really um, very problematic when we think about um, the kinds of problems that often um, are associated with um, having a severe mental illness, um, particularly high levels of coercion and poor physical health and social exclusion. And we think there's um, so many opportunities um, that are out there to support people to have flourishing lives. And so um, that's been really driving um, a lot of the, the work that we've been doing. And we've also been very committed to bringing together people from a range of disciplines, including people with lived experience. And um, you can see that Kath Roper has been a member of this team, uh, Peter McKenzie, who brings a care of lived experience perspective on Kath as well. So the kinds of, this is the program of work that we've been doing. So um, we've built on two previous uh, reviews that we conducted um, back in 2017 and 2016. So different members of the team were involved in some of those reviews. We've also done some um, reviews for the Sachs Institute, one around the design of inpatient units and how they might that might reduce um, seclusion and restraint. Um, and we've also, because of all of that work really increased our experience in teamwork and co-authoring. And one really important, very large piece of work that we did was for the Royal Commission into Victoria's mental health service system. And um, that was very much a focus on people living with severe and persistent mental illness who have specific and complex needs. And we um, did a large literature review where we looked at models of care and support opportunities and therapeutic interventions that might address those needs and might contribute to the kinds of recommendations that the Royal Commission might make. And you can see that that, that was the report um, that we did that really um, spoke to the con contemporary evidence that was available. And um, if you look through the, it's a huge thing, the Royal Commission report, but if you do, we do actually um, find some time to go through it, you'll see that our report was cited um, on numerous occasions by uh, the Commission and we're delighted that we were able to have that work seen in that way and also have some influence. So I'm going to hand over to Kat now because there's been a very important part of our work that's been about consumer researchers. Yep, so I'm a consumer researcher and post doctoral research fellow here at La Trobe University in social work and social policy um, and I'm a qualified social worker as well. Um, and um, part of what I'll speak from today as well as having had the experience of working with other people who have had mental distress and personal and personal recovery and, and family members because that was part of my experience of being a social worker. But in the, the exciting part of um, the reviews that we did for this was the involvement and the opportunities that were provided to both consumer and carer um, uh, researchers. So, we had both consumer and care researchers, which is um, great to have a mixture of um, perspectives. It's especially important since the perspective of consumers and carers is equally valuable, but can be quite um, quite different. Um, it's also important to acknowledge that the opportunities that have been provided through this team and through these papers have included being co-authors and co-authors on some of the other reviews that were mentioned before, like the fact review. It's also really important to remember that 
um, in addition to the consumer commentaries um, that we did, that we're, I was also involved in the technical aspects of designing of um, designing the evidence review, and that's one of the things that I'm really passionate about and I have real skill in, and it's an area where often um, we don't see consumers really taking the leap. Um, another good thing about this project was um, I really enjoyed the experience of then bringing new lived experience researchers and helping them increase their capabilities and capacities so that they can do really high quality, really high quality systematic reviews in the future. Because it's so interesting and it's so subversive and it feels a little bit naughty to be the consumers who are commenting and evaluating and saying whether or not, especially on a technical and on a practical level, this evidence is evidence and if it helps or not. So this is a little bit more about the, I guess, the technical, the technical contributions of lived experience um, and of, of myself to, to the reviews. So um, I've added a statistical meme joke, so hopefully someone finds that good. Um, but it's about acknowledging that in addition to having our own story or our own narrative, that individuals with lived experience have very rich ways of contributing to um, evidence reviews and to research. So um, we utilise um, co-design really extensively, including in technical areas, which is an area that often consumers are very silently left out of, um, that has quite significant ramifications. Another area that's also kind of naughty to, for us to kind of do is to use consumers as individuals to critically appraise the quality of the evidence using um, really traditional quality appraisal tools. We also included a consumer commentary because this is so important because a lot of the evidence um, isn't going to reflect consumer principles or experiences. Um, and so because we're not included empirically and in peer review papers so often, it's really important that we have a space in a peer review paper to fill in the gaps that weren't were left out or weren't represented in those other papers or within the larger source. And it's really important to also note that um, that we also contribute to authorship and dissemination. Uh, that's also another place where I'd like to see existing researchers come into. So here's a, a quick example of what our one of our consumer commentaries um, kind of looks like. And I'll, I'll let you read that on your own. But it's also a little bit about you know, if we're looking at this from an evidence point of view, you have a different perspective between someone, maybe a researcher that doesn't have lived experience compared to maybe a lived experience um, person might see or understand the language um, of the papers differently. Um, and one of the areas that I'm often really critical of is languages that's around um, population. Um, one of the things that we were, um, we had, we were really mindful of was, um, the way that this population specifically tends to be language. Um, so things like SMI and serious and persistent um, and how those um, phrasings of this population um, were uncomfortable um, for us. Um, and it was also to acknowledge that those tensions haven't fully dissolved, that, that we still have to compromise with the way that the language was used in order to connect with more empirical audiences. So um, some of the things um, that we were really interested in looking at was things like the impact of systems of loneliness and social isolation, um, the impact of financial stress, lack of employment, daytime activity, physical health. Um, you know, physical health is um, uh, an area which is often um, neglected in this um, community. Um, the role of housing, family and care support, um, and help to deal with stigma and discrimination, access to mental health services, support for distress and information, and that comes from the paper. What's really exciting, even when we think back to the, the language of the last slide, um, is to, which is still reflecting, I guess, researcher and clinician um, language and experience, is to then think about how um, we are hoping to progress more towards the way that um, we as consumers think of and conceptualize its research problem and how it could be solved and how we could measure these outcomes. 
And so this is from the, Bim the Bimiak Declaration. So for people who are interstate, the Bimiak is um, our peak body for consumers um, in Victoria. And this is from their declaration, which was the piece from 2019, where they, they got together and they wanted to build a picture of what the service system looks like. And you can see compared even to our last slide, that you know, things like animals, nature, acceptance, happier are perhaps how we're not measuring things in the evidence that we found. So it would be great to address in that area. Thanks, Kat. So Bridget, over to you. Yes, thanks, Kat. Um, and that brings us to the publication. How do we get from that set of suite of interests and also the voices of our um, lived experience um, colleagues to uh, the review paper that we're going to be unpacking a bit for you today? And basically, this paper was built from part of the search from that large Royal Commission work that we were commissioned to undertake. Um, we had worked up the very large review for the Royal Commission with more lived expertise, as, um, as Lisa has mentioned. Um, and then we formed up a sub team that was interested in going the distance and using a systematic approach to both appraise and integrate um, a pool of the work. And we were particularly interested in this subset of social interventions for social outcomes and what is and isn't known about that. Um, and look, I can honestly say that we do have an influential team when Steve was describing how does it land, how does, how does work land in world psychiatry? Well, that's definitely some kind of mystery to me also. However, it um, made a significant difference that we had the kind of credibility of the interdisciplinarity of the team um, coming into this work. So that larger group represents all the disciplines that are involved in mental health service provision, as well as the all important lived expertise um, you know, component that has been, um, you know, interwoven over quite a period of time. So we certainly had an excellent leaders in our senior investigators um, and a breadth of perspectives amongst the team who had worked together um, and were prepared to look at literally thousands of abstracts and to start to really pare this down to a um, what still was um, a pretty large body of work to attempt to um, systematically and rigorously appraise and synthesise. Um, but also of, of interest, you know, very wide interest, which are obviously a journal such as World Psychiatry does have enormously wide coverage and so it was possible for some of our senior authors to pitch the idea to um, the editorial group um, with the you know credibility that the group um, carried and then to um, you know risk that that wouldn't necessarily get up so the work we thought was worth doing regardless but that was where we went. Um, it, it has been an in innovative process of partnering with lived experience and I think that was a draw card um, particularly lived experience academics as a formative discipline um, and absolutely necessary to the topic at hand. And um, our aim was to consider people's opportunity for social inclusion and economic participation and what could be said about, you know, interventions that assisted with those things. Let's go to the next slide, thanks. Lisa, please. Yeah, <clears throat> me too. I need to go to the next slide. That's my problem. I've got a second screen. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, socially focused inputs absolutely are needed for um, social outcomes, essential social outcomes. Mm -hmm. And as we know, social exclusion um, is a very major concern for people with this population group that we're discussing, um, being at increased risk of poverty, unemployment and, and poor and unstable housing and how fundamentally um, diminishing that is of this population. And certainly from a kind of, again, world um, perspective, uh, right across developed and non, not developed countries, mental ill health does account for a very significant um, financial impost um, attributed to non-communicable health concerns, according to the World Economic Forum. So it's got that sort of gravitas attached to it as well. Um, the World Health Organization's Mental Health Action Plan um, highlights that people living with um, persistent mental health concerns in the community should have access to integrated and comprehensive health and social care to optimise their health and social outcomes. So the question is, do they? Um, and we were interested in the more recent evidence because I think we recognise that um, this, in, this uh, the search and the integration would be about stuff that, you know, has been initiated, perhaps some of the recovery-based care over 20 plus years, which has emphasised the value of social roles and relationships. But, you know, how are we doing in more recent times? How are we building on that, um, you know, platform of rehabilitation-focused research in the post-institutional um, era? Next slide, please. 
Um, <clears throat> clearly, there's investment in social interventions, but that those have lagged. Um, I think most of us in this community would um, absolutely consider that to be the case behind pharmacological and psychological interventions. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> the psychosocial intervention is in itself um, tricky to um, discriminate sometimes. Um, psychosocial interventions can conflate models of care like ACT that are vehicles for delivering biopsychosocial interventions with what you might think of as pure social um, interventions like supported employment. But intervention, regardless, investment in social interventions has lagged and you know, there are obvious barriers to doing this work well. Um, these are particularly complex interventions, I guess in, complex in the sense of being multifaceted. Um, you know, so some people would say that psychosocial interventions are kind of not rocket science, and that's part of uh, some of the uh, maybe the lesser interest in some cases. Um, they're needing to be personalised. That's part of their complexity. Um, they create problems for systems, um, more so than a problem for people and families to understand or recognise. So in order for interventions to cross over systems and to be multifaceted, that creates that problem of complexity, arguably. Um, there are definitely problems with def definition of, of um, social interventions and we see in the NICE clinical guidelines, um, it refers to family interventions, for example, as psychological interventions, maybe, you know, like CBT, and also as psychosocial interventions, but it doesn't use the term social intervention, even into, in relation to some that clearly are, um, even things like enabling employment, education or community activities. And we think peer support is an interesting one. It's not usually referred to as a psychosocial intervention, but it's clearly very social in its context and its outcomes. There are also problems with assessing outcomes in the psychosocial space. Um, there's such, you know, the, the impact of supported employment is easier to assess than, for example, um, the quality of relationships and quality of life. Um, and we find um, in looking at this literature that we have to work with what is there in terms of the key terms, the outcomes for searching purposes. Um, so in a way, it's not surprising this is a long paper uh, because of the breadth of work that in, in, is attempting to encompass. And um, I'll hand back to Catherine to talk a bit more about the methods we've employed. Thanks. I'm really excited to be talking about the methods for a systematic review, which probably sounds quite funny to people, but um, this is a space where I really like um, our lived experience researchers to get really, really good at and to get excited about as well because it's a great space in which we can can test and create change. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, some of the features of our method. So our specific scope was reporting the effectiveness of certain interventions that were social in content and that aimed to also improve social and economic participation for people living with skin and illness who are also living in the community. Um, we published, we were looking for articles that were published in English which is, I guess, a limitation of our search. And we're looking at 2016 to 2020, which I was um, talking about earlier. So under the search, you can see the range of um, databases that we searched for our articles. And in the next slide, I'll, I'll show you how many there were. Um, so um, Bridget also spoke about um, our terms that we were searching for. So I guess our key heading of terms were around are words that we could use to identify articles that were addressing uh, serious or severe mental illness, the models of care, the intervention and outcome. But obviously, the, the list that we actually used in our searches was much, 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 much longer. Yeah. In terms of our key code for people who are interested in that, our participants were adults, and we had to find within the paper that it was reported that 50% or more actually had a diagnosis of schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, and think bipolar as well. And we can talk about that a little bit later on um, around um, how we think about using diagnostic um, in that space. But um, we also look at interventions. So we could do interventions for individuals, um, for a group or for a community. Um, we don't have a comparator listed because we weren't just doing RPT, which is often what systematic reviews are for. We opened it up a little bit further and we were looking at qualitative um, mixed methods and quantitative, so that's how we came up with the C from PICO. In terms of our outcomes, we were looking for social and relevant interventions, so social skills, social functioning, carer and support experience, housing, schooling, employment, engagement, and activities and empowerment. 
So papers like um, editorials or other reviews or their analysis were excluded. We were looking to, um, to put that intervention in the papers. And our, we also conducted a quality assessment in our quality assessment tool was the payment. Very, very exciting. So for anyone who's going to a systematic review, I'd love to share that we total screened 18,000, or we, we had a total number of 18,540 titles at the beginning um, before removing duplicate. And after the process of, um, of screening, that title screening, abstract screening, uh, we've had a total of 72. So here's just a quick little summary table. Um, Often people, especially psychiatrists who are empirically trained, are very interested in the number of RCTs within uh, a group of evidence, and systematic reviews are certainly designed to pick up RCTs. But we can see how our review was actually really important and really interesting because there actually weren't that many RCTs in the papers that we that we identified. So if we were only including RCTs, we can get a sense of how much in, important information we were looking at. And we can also notice that, um, you know, most of the countries um, that were included in these publications were um, were kind of wealthy, um, were kind of wealthy countries. And what's that? Yeah, so people who aren't familiar with that term, we're talking about randomised control trials, which is sometimes sort of talked about as sort of the gold standard evidence. Um, and yeah, that low and middle income countries that we included, we didn't see as many papers as we would have liked, and we'll come back to that later. But basically, um, you know, we did this rigorous process and we um, we had two reviewers um, for all the full text reviews, and then we did we had um, a senior reviewer who also helped us with any kind of conflicts in terms of which should, what should be in, what should be out. We did, we in small groups, we summarised um, the papers that were in particular groups. Um, and you can see here the, uh, the kinds of groups that we and we were able to summarise it to um to put the papers into, and then we 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 summarise those papers. So if you look at our paper, you can see that there are summaries um under each of these these headings. Um, and then with the narrative syn synthesis, we were able to identify patterns of findings across included studies, and we explored whether the effects of an intervention vary according to the study population. We identified factors that may influence the results within individual studies and explain the differences in findings between studies. Um, we didn't develop a theoretical framework because uh, we had too many um, studies that we included um, and it was going to be too much for us to do that in terms of like, the underpinning effects of each intervention. But we summarised the factors that potentially um, were relevant to effectiveness and implementation across our included social interventions. And of course, we did an assessment of the robustness, robustness of the synthesis together. We had weekly meetings and um, we worked together quite, quite a lot to really come to a shared understanding of what we were seeing. So, um, and yeah, we had 41 papers that were at the service level, what we might call service level interventions, which is supportive accommodation, uh, supportive education, supportive employment. And 31 papers that were what we talked about as the service user level interventions, which were family interventions, community participation, peer support, and social skills training. So I'll take you through those now a little bit more. So with the service level models that supported accommodation, as I said, we had 16 eligible studies, nine focused on housing first, and some are very good quality with positive outcomes in relation to achieving stable housing. So that's one of the most common outcome measures for these kinds of studies. But there were also other models of supported housing, and they were also associated with positive outcomes, particularly regarding housing and independence. And many studies highlighted the value of supported accommodation for people's recovery. But there were also varied outcomes depending on people's needs. And what we noticed is that needs tailoring and the use of different models um, depending on people's needs and also the context. So with supported education, there were five papers focused on recovery colleges. Um, so a lot of that evidence has moved away from what might have been a sort of more integrated education type of approach to what we found was mostly recovery colleges in this more recent evidence. It was consistently positive regarding student satisfaction and improvements in well-being and reduced social isolation, and often described as a stepping stone 
um, to other kinds of opportunities in the community, but no RCTs, and there could really a need for more robust research. And I'm aware that there's the Recollect study that's in the UK that's addressing that very issue. So um, watch that space in terms of the um, work on the public colleges. Supported employment, 20 studies that we could group into three main types, individual placement and support, sh um, sheltered employment and vocational rehab, and individual placement and support sustains very good evidence of positive employment outcomes, um, but it's very important to maintain fidelity. And there were also these papers on supplemental interventions to enhance employment outcomes, but it was hard to achieve engagement in those enhancements like cognitive remediation. Um, they seem to be helpful in some contexts and in some age groups. And there was good outcomes regarding employment in many studies, um, but how this is defined can vary. And lots of the implementation issues, cultural issues are important. And volunteering is a worthy goal with good recovery outcomes. So community participation, nine studies on that. Um, and um, this is uh, interventions such as the clubhouses and community-based social clubs, recovery camps, art, gardening, farm experiences, are all, all associated with reduced social isolation, a sense of belonging, but needs a lot more controlled studies and trials, um, randomized control trials in particular are needed. Family interventions, 11 papers included, um, because as we talked about earlier, we, we really came to the conclusion that family improved family relationships really represent a social outcome. Um, and we found that often um, some of the more contemporary um, pieces of research included a carer, peer support or co-facilitator. Um, but they can have all sorts of implementation challenges, including both staff and families experiencing barriers to participation. So it's something that we've probably seen quite consistently that despite the evidence, we don't see the uptake of family interventions um, as much as we'd like, maybe. And social skills training, only four papers, but there's lots of evidence for improving social outcomes. Um, it's not strong and it's a bit mixed. Um, and some of the work to have community-based um, social skills training um, can see improvements on cognitive tests, but it doesn't seem to transfer to, to real life um, social functioning. So we're gonna hand over to Kat to talk about what we found about um, peer work. Yep, so we were, I was very pleased to see that peer work came up in our findings. Um, it also meant that our search strategy accomplished what we wanted to do as well. Um, and although there was only a small number of peer work uh, kind of articles, um, and although peer work was um, inspired through other, um, other articles as well, um, there was there were suggestions that there was some positive outcomes for having um, peer workers, but certainly was enough, I think, to encourage exploring um, that discipline and how that discipline can be best used. Um, it's it's of note that the, the peer work force has been um, criticised and analysed and tested and studied in the really because ever, uh, which is interesting that that has been the case. But I think when we're looking at peer work and we're looking at how you would have this um, in a study and whether we can we can trust um, our, some of our results, we need to think about how we're not optimally um, supporting this emerging workforce and how that could also impact on things like effectiveness and other outcomes. So this is things like inequitable workplace conditions, so often not having a, a peer manager or having peer supervision. Um, at all not having enough time to grow mature and gain experience within your discipline. Um, it's also impacted by organisations, structural and social factors. So also the remote professor design the study has a um, design study that we complement um, or work with what their workers do and measure that well. Um, we did find that it was associated with greater self-efficacy, which I like to think is about doing doing things that you like to do um, in an easy way and to um, manage to um, increase that social function. Um, as we said, there was a weakness in the methods and what is measured. So we need to think really carefully about the methods that we use when we're evaluating peer work and whether or not we can just trust the results. So Bridget, back to you. 
Thanks. Thanks, guys. So we're on the home straight, thinking about the synthesis of all this um, of this information and, and what might be some of the patterns that you could see across the different areas. And clearly there were areas of more mature research than others. Um, but there is an encouraging level of research interest, even in these very recent years in social interventions, including randomised control trials, except in the field of the supported education they were lacking. Um, and it does seem that this is building on the earlier post-institutional or rehab foundations. So that's um, encouraging to see. Um, there was the, um, you know, that there is this corroboration, I guess, for particularly the mature data around housing support, individual placement support, family um, support. And then there was um, the tweaking of that around the issue of needing to see um, tailoring or some modifications to context. And that was, was true particularly, and we'll come back to that around the, um, around the accommodation uh, topic in particular. Um, and yeah, the, the, the findings on the cognitive augmentation or co cognitive remediation is interesting um, because it did not appear that these generalise to everyday social skills and a couple of exceptions related in particular to behavioural psychological approach of something called errorless learning, um, errorless learning, but overall um, those were um, not strong findings. The positive results for peer support in did include four randomised control trials and those are encouraging and they seem to be that the outcomes at the end of those were tended to um, pertain to confidence and engagement. Um, and the fact that there were only a small number of a paucity of economic um, studies in this field is problematic for the ongoing um, sustainability of what, have we, as we've described earlier, can be um, quite complex to implement. Next slide, please. Um, we looked at what were common stories of um, success and failure, in, in particular in maintaining quality. And essentially, um, there were a set of facilitators, um, particularly that really um, related to commitment, uh, commitment at an organisational level, and then also to quality, which was expressed in the attention to process and to people over, you know, what is quite a long time course for many of these interventions. So whether that was about the quality of training delivery, um, the ongoing supervision, the monitoring of process and progress, um, and the formation of a team approach to the implementation process. So those were some of the areas of, you know, that represented commitment and quality. <clears throat> and then in terms of barriers, um, these were seen to occur at a kind of local operational level, but also at quite a stand back societal level or at a public policy level, there were barriers. Um, and so, yeah, there could be non-alignment of local policies and contextual challenges locally. Um, and for instance, um, in terms of supported accommodation, there's quite a sort of high level um, uh, population housing policies that had a significant impact on difference between them um, and the same with employment levels of local employment and so forth. Um, and particularly in relation to families um, and family interventions, the negative referrer attitudes and the ability to access them were significant barriers for some, for some interventions to, to, to be sustained to a high quality level. Um, next slide. Factors, difference. Yep, that's it. Um, so yeah, keep just thinking about the the supported accommodation um, piece in particular, um, the policy context could be either a barrier or an enabler. And there was a very wide diversity in housing policy, even within a country. So Canada has a lot of the literature around housing first, for example, but variations between states and even local council districts made a difference to the success or otherwise of housing first. Um, cultural norms had a bearing, um, particularly in areas of employment. Um, and family, what might be considered the norms around um, engagement in the workforce and family responsibilities and so forth. Um, there were some specific service component um, barriers in the forensic setting, for example, around employment or engagement of families. Um, and there were supports, things that supported adaption, um, you know, that we've described as necessary in some instances, um, were also potentially working against the idea of any of these studies um, being implemented consistently or in a standardised way. So that on the one hand, you have the, tr the trade-off of a standardised intervention for evidence building, but then you've got the need for local adaption or, or support for adaption that leads to better outcomes at, you know, in, within that context. 
even when consistency was possible um so there weren't these more ideological barriers or or, or genuine barriers um, to consistency just the, at the most basic level key terms language um, and vast differences in duration were significant obstacles to comparability so on that I'll note I'll hand back to Lisa to bring us home in terms of limitations and the and the larger contribution of the study to the evidence thanks Lisa yeah so um, th there's this question of the strength of the evidence and its generalizability is something that you know we at Alive uh, in particular might be really interested in and thinking about how much do we sort of, um, what do we do in terms of driving some of the translation of this evidence? Um, and some of the common limitations are really this, this idea of all the different things that are actually being measured and the range of measures being used. Um, and how does how do you actually determine what's actually been successful or a good outcome? And you can see this even across the different studies in terms of the different kinds of measures they use, but even in the in particular context so you can might even see housing or employment there's still um, different kinds of things that these employment um, focused studies are actually measuring so they might measure the number of people employed or the duration of how many, of how many hours they've been employed per week um, or what wages they earned and then we've got this issue of bespoke tools so that means that the researchers have actually come up with a tool themselves um, that hasn't been psychometrically tested and also can't necessarily then be used to compare um, that, those same outcomes across different studies, which causes some, some issues around generalizability. Um, and Bridget's already mentioned these problems about um, varying follow-up periods. So you might see some studies that have had the opportunity to follow people up over, over quite a long time, some quite a short time. So it's actually quite difficult to make comparisons. And also we, we, we commonly notice that what a, a study will refer to treatment as usual, um, but that isn't necessarily well described. So it becomes really tricky to know um, uh, the degree to which treatment as usual translates across different studies in terms of what people are getting or not. Um, and we've already mentioned that not many studies were, were actually conducted in low and middle income countries. There's a strong um, emphasis on many of the participants in these studies being men. Uh, so perhaps there are important gender differences that aren't being picked up. And, you know, that idea of the champion and the local enthusiast, you know, maybe driving a lot, of, um, a lot of this work and how do you actually replicate that elsewhere. So, you know, finally, social interventions need to be targeted to the person and, and be con context specific. And that actually... Um, can be quite a challenge to get buy-in to enable that to happen. Um, study, studies of the same intervention may report similar positive findings, but it might, this might obscure more nuanced interpretations. So for example, you know, just getting a, a low wage job uh, for a few hours, is this really um, a social outcome? Is this really a social benefit to the person? Um, and you know, similarly, we saw that some people were achieving housing stability in some of these studies, but they weren't that wasn't necessarily translating to good recovery outcomes or other clinical outcomes. And so what's actually happening for those people um, might be something we'd want to further explore. And of course, the success of an intervention might be influenced by culture. So it may not be as important in a very family-focused type of culture to have people actually achieve independent living. That may not be the priority. And a recovery orientation seems relevant to all of these social interventions. And it seems to be particularly facilitated by having peer support workers. Um, and of course, they're also making lots of other contributions in these studies. So our conclusions are that our findings corroborate existing evidence for investment in supported accommodation, supported employment and family interventions for people with severe mental illness. Um, there's encouraging evidence for peer involvement um, in delivery of social interventions. There needs to be um, more health economics emphasis because it's likely to influence government support for these interventions. Um, but we also need to continue to investigate what social outcomes are of most relevance to service users. Um, would these be valued by society enough to support the investment that's needed? Are we, are we really going to put company behind some of these important things like loneliness and social connection? Um, and does social inclusion have to be participating in the mainstream or do we also um, see the value in having some continuing standalone services that are specifically focused on people's 
to be mental illness. So these are some of the resources, um, the recommendations that um, for expanding the evidence base. Uh, we, we think an internationally agreed definition of what constitutes a social inter intervention is required. We need to have agreement on the high level social outcomes that should be reported. We really encourage journals um, to encourage more consistency of definitions in papers um, and to describe better what they're talking about um, and have greater consistency in the delivery um, and methods of studies evaluating the same intervention. As we've already talked about, encouraging more RCTs. Valuing qualitative evidence is actually really important. And if you read our paper, you'll see how much qualitative evidence really contributed to our understanding of these interventions and what people are getting out of them. And of course, the future needs more lived experience, voice, co-design and co-production. And we've got some resources and references there. And I'll particularly draw your attention to this um, nice um, uh, um, summary that was uh, undertaken by Mad in America. Um, and uh, you may not want to read our 28 pages, but those five pages were actually pretty good at summarising the paper. So thank you very much, and I'll stop sharing there. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, I, I see we've got about um, just over 10 minutes for um, discussion. I, I just, um, what was one comment I'd make? It's hard enough standardizing something when you're doing psychotherapy research a social intervention must be even harder yeah 